Welcome. Good evening, friends and colleagues, and uh, thank you all for being here. We're here tonight because of a new book, Black Immigrant Literacies, Intersections of Race, Language, and Culture in the Classroom, authored by Dr. Patrianne Smith and published by Teachers College Press in late 2023. My name is Emily, and I'm the Digital Marketing Manager at TC Press. And on behalf of the publisher, thank you for joining us in what is sure to be an enlightening conversation. We're fortunate to be joined by the author, Dr. Patrianne Smith, as well as an esteemed group of panelists and moderators. Our enormous thanks to them for taking time out of their schedules to be here tonight. Uh, we're so grateful for the sharing of your insights and expertise in this format, and we're eager to hear what you have to say. So I'll do some very quick housekeeping and then hand it over to Dr. Smith. The book shows how to center, affirm, and develop Black liter immigrant literacies and includes lesson plans and concrete examples that range from K-12 to college. We are offering a discount on this book, 20% off, for attendees of this webinar. The details for that will be in your chat panel, as well as a follow-up email. So please, if you haven't already, remember to purchase your copy. Uh, please be aware as well that we are recording. The link to the full webinar will also be included in that follow-up email. So please share it with anyone who might find it valuable. We'll conclude our hour together with a brief Q&A. So if you have questions for our panelists, please put them in the Zoom chat window. And last but not least, please visit the Teachers College Press website, sign up for our mailing list, follow us on social, for over 120 years, TCP has been committed to addressing the ideas that matter most to educators. And we have many resources for the educational community in literacy, bilingual and multilingual education, multicultural and so social justice education, and many other areas in the field. So please check us out and let us know what interests you. Without further ado, please welcome Patrianne Smith. Thank you so much, uh, Emily. It is such a pleasure to be here this evening. It is wonderful to be surrounded by such esteemed scholars in the field. And without further ado, we would just like to get started and have our panelists introduce themselves to us today. We have with us, uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Sean Del Nero, Dr. Allison Skerritt, Dr. Arya Raswar and Dr. Vaughn Watson. So let's just give them a chance to tell us who they are and how they came to this work. Just a few minutes to share a little bit about who you are. Dr. Nero, thank you. Hey, okay. uh, good evening all. I'm Shondell Nero, a professor of language education at New York University here in New York City. Um, thank you all for coming to this really enriched conversation. Um, I came to this work as a Caribbean person. I was born and raised in Guyana and um, while doing doctoral work in New York, encountered a number of Caribbean students placed in English as a second language class. And that started my question about who's a speaker of English, who's a native speaker. And all of that led to my work almost 30 years ago now. And uh, that's built a career of work on Black language. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shondell, for sharing. Uh, we'll go next to Dr. Uh, Allison Skerritt. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Hello, everyone. My name is Allison Skerritt. I'm a professor of language and literacy studies uh, in the College of Education at the University of Texas at Austin. I am also uh, someone who is a Caribbean person. I was born and raised in Dominica, um, and so I've had schooling both in the Caribbean and in the United States. Um, and I, I came to this work as really a literacy scholar interested in the multiliteracy practices of youth of color. And in doing this work, came upon uh, some young people who were transnational, a name that I did not really, a concept I didn't really have at the time. But um, I began uh, becoming interested in these uh, young people's uh, stories who were not um, of Caribbean origin. But uh, over a number of years, I was able to sort of make my way back to sort of um, studying uh, transnationalism um, within the context of the Caribbean and Caribbean um, originated uh, peoples. And uh, through that work, um, I've come to know uh, Dr. Smith and, and her work. And so I'm really happy to be here tonight for uh, this conversation. Thank you so much, Allison, uh, for sharing that. Uh, Dr. Raswar, Arya. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Arya Raswar, Professor of Literacy, Language, and Culture at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Uh, I came to this work through my interest in language ideologies and educational linguistics. Uh, I've I've always been fascinated with uh, the immigrant experience and how 
they maintain or uh, not maintain their linguistic heritage. And I think this conversation about the Black ex uh, immigrant experience is very critical to understanding uh, that phenomenon. So I'm really happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rasbar. And now, uh, Vaughn Watson, Dr. Vaughn Watson. Hi, everyone. Um, just so excited and appreciative, um, Dr. Smith, of the opportunity to join the conversation. I'm Vaughn Watson, I'm Associate Professor of English Ed here at Michigan State. I uh, come, come to this work as a Black uh, American teaching and learning with Black youth in Brooklyn schools for 12 years, still very much think of myself as a teacher, and just very much interested in the creative and artistic practices and artifacts of youth and how you know, leading with youth participatory methodologies, we can rethink notions of student work and teacher practice, uh, and just uh, excited for the opportunity to be in conversation with y'all. Thank you so much, Vaughn. This is wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Um, I am so happy. I cannot tell you just how great it is to have all of y'all in a room, well, symbolically, together. And it is just absolutely wonderful to also be joined by the esteemed Dr. Yuri Dissi Bauer, who is here with us this evening, serving as a moderator for the session, and also the esteemed Dr. Gwendolyn McMillan. Uh, welcome to the session, and I'm going to hand over to you both as the moderators as you continue to lead us into discussion for this evening. Dr. McMillan, do you want to start or would you like? Um, I can start out. Thanks, Dr. Bauer. So good evening, everyone. It is such an honor and privilege to be with all of you. I am especially excited about um, uplifting and amplifying these authentic voices about the Black immigrant experience. I am from the United States. However, the connection that we have, oh, I should say that I'm a professor of literacy at Oakland University in Rochester, Michigan. I do not live by the ocean, but the sun is shining in my heart. Um, my work focuses on uh, Black children's out-of-school experiences and how we can build on those. Um, to improve literacy, teaching, and learning in their classrooms at school, specifically the experiences that they have in the Black church, which is a direct connection to the Black immigrant experience. And so, um, again, I am excited about amplifying these authentic voices. Thank you so much, Patreon, for including me. I'm Eurydice Bauer, and I'm a faculty member at the University of South Carolina. Um, I also run the Bilingualism Matters um, Center at the University of South Carolina. Um, I come to this uh, topic as someone who's experienced different ends of this um, issue in the sense that I was born in Haiti started my education in Haiti. However, trans, uh, came to the US at a young age, elementary age. Um, and so I have experiences going, bo uh, covering both Haiti as well as the US, but I also went through what many children still go through today, which is being in a context where very few people understand your experience. There's the issue of language, but language can also be used as a way to mask a number of other things that are not understood and so on. And this is what I'm really excited about, why I think Dr. Smith's book is so timely in the sense that it brings attention to the different layers that are involved in all of this. So I look forward to this conversation and I'm thankful for the invitation to be here with you. Thank you so much to you both for sharing. And uh, Dr. McMillan, would you like to go ahead and, and begin your questions to the panelists? Actually, Yuri is supposed to take the first one. <laughs> I think time with time, that's probably why we're do, skipping over that. The first one, yes. Yes. First question, sorry. Um, first question I have is actually for Dr. Shondell Nero. Um, so 
you graciously authored the foreword for Dr. Smith's book, drawing upon your decades, as you mentioned, of groundbreaking research that began with Caribbean lives, literacies and Englishes, crossing boundaries and being racialized and has remained foundational to multiple fields. So as you think back on your inception and coming to this work in the academy, how have you seen the ebb and flow of Caribbean literacies and Englishes along with the racialization that accompanies them characterize literacy research over time? Wow, <laughs> that's quite Thanks a so lot. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> Thank you so much. I got what five minutes. I'll see if I can try to do that. So as I mentioned, um, the work started uh, 30 years ago while I was a doctoral student at Teachers College. I mentioned that I was born and raised in Guyana. <laughs> former British colony on the cusp of South America, but um, culturally Caribbean. And so I'm a product of this group that as I was teaching while I was doing doctoral work at uh, Long Island University in New York, um, I had a young man from my own country in an English as a second language class. And so my question was, um, how did someone from a supposedly English speaking country end up in an English as a second language class? And little did I know that was going to become my dissertation topic. And so from his being in my class, I turns out that a number of other Caribbean students at that time, this is the early 90s, were being placed in English second language classes. And much to the students' chagrin because they saw themselves as native speakers of English and why are they being placed as non-native speakers. And so that got me thinking of, well, what is happening here? But some of the students, um, you know, uh, made noise and got themselves out of the class. And so my work started from that to raise awareness to the teachers in New York schools. And out of that placement of Caribbean students in ESL classes, um, questions to the field began, what is a native speaker? Who gets to decide that? What do we define as English? Um, and who gets to decide that? Um, what are the implications for this population that people did not understand um, for placement and policies? And then it started raising questions about race and identity um, and otherness, because certainly someone with an Irish accent um, would not be put in an ESL class compared to someone with a uh, Caribbean accent. So the work um, the, the work, the early work then came out of the sociolinguistic literature. This was building on the work of African-American scholars like Geneva Smitherman and John Rickford and other Caribbean scholars who at the time were asking these very questions. Um, but, and for African-American students where their language as dialect was being stigmatized in schools. And most of that um, ha was more about race than about language. And so it's so I came out of that sociolinguistic tradition to bring the work into what my field was TESOL, um, because my master's was in TESOL and I'm in a language training program here at NYU. We're training English second language teachers. So you have this sort of bifurcation of literacy research and language research, and we're all talking about language. <laughs> Um, we're all talking about multilingual populations. So the work then was this sort of um, bi-dialectal language of let's affirm the home language and let's get students um, uh, fluent in standardized English and somehow that gives them access and acceptability. Um, and over the years, we started seeing, well, um, even that was not necessarily an answer to the, to the question of, you know, appropriateness and accessibility of language. And, and so the, the work evolved from looking at, you know, acquiring some so-called standard to um, be accepted to what is really being evaluated? Is it the language or is it the people behind the language that's being evaluated? And um, as we moved over time, we started getting more immigrant, Black immigrants in schools and greater numbers of African students um, in addition to the already African-American population. And what I saw in the work was this evolution now where, um, looking at race more critically upfront um, 
became much more um, enriched. And I think when we got to the point of um, the work of Nelson Flores and others theorizing it as racial linguistics, it really um, unveiled the sort of elephant in the room, which was this sort of white colonial gaze on language that's underlying all of the assessments um, that, that, that we have. And so um, I think the um, building on the social linguistic work, I think the research um, has, has really been enriched by um, not using these kind of monolithic lens of what is English and what is Black and what is Native and what is non-Native, but really looking at it more holistically of the whole student and all of their language um, to a place when I think Patrian's book really speaks to it now in a much more global way. So I, I think that um, I've been pleased to see the evolution of the literature building on sociolinguistic work and bringing all the black populations together and not having this bifurcation of black American, black Caribbean, black African, when in fact, we're all, the, the elephant in the room is looking at race and colonial logics of language and having a more um, dynamic way of looking at language, which is which is where I think we are now. And I think it's really wonderful to see that evolution over the years. So I'll stop there. <laughs> wow, Dr. Nero, thank you so much for sort of laying the foundation for the conversation. Um, we really appreciate the beautiful foreword that you prepared for Patrienne's book. It is awesome. And thank so you. we want to, from there, ask Dr. Smith, uh, as a small island St. Lucian mother scholar educator with a Trinidadian daughter of Nigerian heritage navigating the landscape of the United States, you come to this book with the richness of the personal that you infuse into the profession mm -hmm. as you read and write the worlds created in Black immigrant literacies. Tell us, Dr. Smith, how did you reconcile your small island Caribbeanness? and the vast landscape that is the US, uh, the United States, as you come to author this book. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. McMillan. I think tonight we're getting all the heavy questions, Dr. Nero, very, very extended questions. But it was great that, uh, you know, Shandell, you laid that foundation of where we came from in the field and all of the intersecting lenses that have brought us to this place. I keep thinking about how many scholars have been doing this kind of work, this very same work, using a different language to explain it. And how many of us now are coming to a conversation that has been long established, but we're simply trying to say over and over again, let's make things better for kids. Let's get kids to thrive in classrooms. And underlying all of this conversation, uh, I think, is is that sense of humanity that we're trying to affirm the children with whom we work in classrooms. I thought I might just share a little uh, snippet of how I came to this conversation about Black immigrant literacies by showing you a few pictures of uh, my home island in St. Lucia. So just permit me, hopefully this is going to, um, this is going to populate here. I hope that everyone can see the slides. Um, and so here, I, I thought I might just show you a little bit of where I came from and then how I got into this sort of global minded uh, positioning that then allowed me to get to the place of black immigrant literacies. Here is just an example uh, in, in the photo of the small island, you know, the ocean there. Um, moving from a small island, in my case, St. Lucia, you can see here, I lived in the village of Monrepo to the uh, right hand side of the image there in the south of the island. It's a very small island. Uh, and so my journey to literacy actually began in that village. And most children, their journeys begin in a space, in a place where there are things happening with language all the time. For me, it was hearing the fascinating sounds, the semiotics of languages and literacies, via speaking and music and dancing and swearing at a very tender age. I heard a lot of that consistently, a very much a part of 
what I was exposed to uh, in that village. Uh, and I think my mom is probably in the audience. I hope she was able to get on the Zoom call. But if she is there, she will remember sort of seeing the St. Lucian French Creole, the St. Lucian English vernacular, the St. Lucian Standard English, sort of being intertwined and always present in the linguistic repertoire that my siblings and I had as we grew up as children in that small island context. Another part of that small island identity that I want to just touch on briefly tonight has to do with the connection to land that was very much a part of who we were. We spent a lot of time, as my siblings and I, uh, working through in the farm through different literacy practices. And this is uh, the farm where I spent most of my childhood days um, as a primarily homeschooled child in Monrepo, just about 45 minutes away from my home. And we would go there to the banana plantations and carry bananas and deflower bananas. And that was very much a part of my childhood and my young adult sort of life. There was agricultural literacy, religious literacy, family literacy, financial literacies. And even though there was a lot of prohibition of certain kinds of named language practices, we still persisted to use these various parts of our linguistic repertoires and to thrive with them. And so who am I, I, I guess, who am I became part of all of those pieces merging together, right? The farm, the literacy practices, not just the ones that I was learning from my father and my mother in the home, uh, traditionally, based on what we call the code, but also what I was learning in the farm, what I was learning through nature, in the river, in the mud, in the rain, in the sunshine, in the economics of creating, uh, you know, the banana plantation uh, production. There was a lot of stuff going on there. And so those literacies really would become uh, what helped me to become fascinated with our uh, language and its capacity to liberate and to free the mind as a scholar. And so as I come to this work, I think of how serendipitously, and I, I had a conversation recently with Dr. Nero about this, that the serendipitous nature of how this came to be uh, really led to that intellectual thinking and theorizing about what it means to connect race, language, and immigration from a personal perspective being linked now to a theoretical sort of approach. And so, uh, you know, coming to the United States, observing my daughter, observing children, experiencing the academy, I saw so many instances of becoming Black, becoming immigrants, becoming a non-native speaker of English, occurring in the lives of the people around me and also in my life as well, and really trying to make sense of how do I articulate uh, what this means for literacy practice, not just for Black students, but for curricula in general. And so uh, this, this kind of wraps it up for me, really, uh, by taking me to research such as the work of Dr. Shandel Nero, which really was part of a lot of where I started my initial theorizing, and then looking at diaspora, racial, and transnational literacy by centering it around a racial linguistic perspective from the research of Dr. Jonathan Rosa and Nelson Flores. And so I just wanted to kind of provide this brief overview as a way for you to get a sense of how I came to the Black immigrant literacy perspective, sort of reconciling my small islandness with the global uh, sort of perspective that, that I believe uh, I have now come to hold, and then demonstrating what that has looked like and what that feels like for the Black immigrant child or the Black immigrant youth, uh, with the understanding that we cannot essentialize these experiences because they tend to look very different depending on who we are referring to and whose experience we are actually talking about. So I'll hand over back to you, uh, Dr. Uh, McMillan. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Smith. Such rich experiences in, from your background and connecting the personal and professional. We really appreciate that. Your vision for Black immigrant literacies 
as one that resurrects the dormant literacies of the Caribbean and places them in conversation again with that of those in the United States is a bold one. How did you come to connect these ideas? So I think, yeah, you got cut off a little bit, but I believe you said, how did I come to connect these ideas? So I'm just going to, yeah, go off yes. of that. And in what ways did your book help to achieve the goal? It looked like something froze. Did you hear the whole question? Yes. Okay. Yes, I did. I did. Thank you so much, Dr. McMillan. So uh, how did I come to connect these ideas? I would say that a lot of it came with observing my daughter while at the same time observing black youth and then experiencing a lot of racialization myself in the academy. So there were multiple or multifaceted parts of this that were happening all at once, but then there were deepening experiences, for instance, in the academy where I was seeing how it was my body, like Dr. Nero said earlier, my body was, was what was being racialized in a way that was then intertwining with my language. And when I got to the, you know, racial linguistics and a racial linguistic perspective, I thought, okay, this is, this is actually what's happening, you know, with a lot of what I'm seeing with kids and with my daughter, this is what I'm seeing, that race and language are intertwining. And I thought, what a powerful theoretical lens to bring to this uh, experience that I was still examining at the time and trying to make sense of with the Black immigrant perspective. And as I did that, the nationality and how, you know, becoming racialized meant that the ethnicity needed to be left behind or that one had to be sacrificed and the other chosen. I was trying to understand how do we help youth live full lives? And so in my perspective, I was really trying to make sense of my experience while I was looking at the experiences of these youth also trying to flourish and seeing my daughter as a Black immigrant trying to go through the school system herself and become a thriving uh, human being. And so there were multiple parts of this that I believe all led me to this place where I occupied that position, which I'm still, I would admit, trying to understand and to make sense of uh, fully. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith, for those responses. And I just want to remind the audience um, that you can purchase the book. Uh, there is a discount. If you're attending, you can get your copies on a Teachers College Press website, on Amazon, and in bookstores worldwide. And now I'm going to turn it over to my um, home moderator, Dr. Bauer. All right. So this was wonderful to hear directly from Dr. Smith, her ideas and how all of this came together. Let's bring some other voices into this dialogue a little bit. So this question is actually for Dr. Skerritt. So your extensive body of research on nuances surrounding transnational literacy includes the book, Teaching Transnational Youth, Literacy and Education in a Changing World a text which has been transformative for the field of literacy and beyond, and is in part drawn upon in Dr. Smith's book as, the art, as she articulates the framework for Black immigrant literacies. Now, in your view, how do you see transnational literacy working with the Black immigrant literacies framework to create opportunities and a promise for connecting Caribbean and North American lives? Well, thank you for that, uh, Dr. Bauer, uh, both for uh, the kind remarks about the, the book and, and the body of work and uh, for this question, indeed, really heavy hitting questions uh, tonight. Um, you know, when uh, I began reading Patrianne's work, I just thought, wow, this this scholar is 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 telling finally telling our story. 
Like she is telling the story of, you know, the, the black English speaking, you know, Caribbean young person who comes to the United States and who is trying to really make sense of, of who they are in the, this new space, who they are as an English speaker, as a language speaker, as a language architect to use her fabulous, you know, term. Um, and, uh, and who's trying to sort of find solidarity in, um, in a space where there are just often too many tensions, too many um, myths, uh, all of which, you know, Dr. Smith really brings forth in, in, in her book. And so I personally over and over again, thanked Dr. Smith for, for telling this uh, story and um, continuing to, to, to do this, this work. Um, you know, and I've also talked with Dr. Smith about the terms immigrant and transnational um, uh, uh, now assistant professor at uh, University of Washington, Dr. Lakia Omegan and, and, and I have uh, done some work actually in the special issue edited by, by Dr. Smith, thinking about you know, what we mean by the term immigrant and what we mean by the term transnational and what looking at these terms together can, can afford us. I think you know, thinking back on my own sort of personal um, journey, it feels as if I, you know, I've sort of started with the term immigrant and then moved on to the term transnational. But in reading Dr. Smith's work, feeling like I can return to the term uh, immigrant, but with a much richer way of, of, of really understanding what that term means. Um, I think, you know, when we have had literature on the immigrant, you know, experience, oftentimes it, it's suggested that, that, that those of us who are immigrants have left behind um, our old ways of, of doing language and, and literacy and are taking up new ways of being and that we are sort of fossilized into these new spaces and have left the, 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 the old behind. And the term transnational, I, I have uh, proposed, allows us to um, consider how we, we have not left these things behind. We continue to be border crossers in our language practices and our literacy practices, even for those of us who are not frequently engaging in physical uh, border uh, crossings. So I think we, we do need both terms. I think the term immigrant continues to be salient. It continues to mark a particular sociopolitical location and allows us to do important work. And I think that the way Patrianne has theorized uh, Black immigrant literacies really does bring in the transnational so, so seamlessly and so powerfully. I think what the, the Black literacies uh, framework really offers to work in transnationalism is really an opportunity for us to think very critically about language, race, and literacy altogether. I think for many of us who, um, are, who do work on transnational literacies and work in that space, oftentimes we leave out uh, the sociopolitics of, of race. Oftentimes we, oftentimes we think, um, quite a lot about the multi-literacies practices, but to Shondell's point, you know, language and literacy practices are, are so intertwined, and I think Dr. Smith really allows us as literacy scholars to think about languages and literacies uh, together, and then, of course, to layer into that the, um, the aspect of, of, of race. So we're thinking about the ratio-semiotic um, architecture that young people uh, engage in, for example, thinking about the racialization processes that, 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 that Black immigrants go through, um, and thinking about issues of Black diaspora community, thinking about issues of, of solidarity. So I, I, I find that the framework is really bold. It really um, confronts some difficult uh, truths and myths and tensions that have existed and really, really persisted in Black diasporic, uh, diasporic spaces for, um, for a, a very long time. Yuri and I have talked about uh, our own experiences as Black immigrant, um, well, as, in her case, a child, in my case, and a, a young person um, in the school system um, and how uh, certain things were not named but were surely felt. Um, and how we struggled to establish solidarity with our Black American peers and, and others from other parts of, of the world. Um, and, and how I wish our teachers had, had had this text and were able to lead us in, in these very complex and difficult conversations um, and to help us sort of, uh, uh, sort of uh, develop solidarity and work toward uh, uh, racial justice toward um, linguistic justice um, for um, for all of us. So, so uh, I really do see uh, the work adding a, a critical racial 
uh, perspective uh, to work on transnationalism. I certainly see it expanding uh, the vistas from which we can view transnational young people. Uh, Dr. Smith and I have talked about how um, for so long there has really been uh, an um, invisibility um, of the, 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 the languages, the literacies, the lives of, of, of Black Caribbean originated um, immigrant youth. And, and her work is really uh, amplifying those experiences, um, but really uh, helping us think, think with those experiences toward um, a, a community that is diasporic, a community where we are all sort of language architects, where we're all working against racism, where we're all sort of working toward um, a, a common goal. Um, so those are some reflections, and I'm, I'm happy to say more um, as we continue the conversation. But thank you for the question. And Dr. Smith, uh, thank you so much again um, for, for uh, this work. Such a wonderful response. Certainly a lot to think about and to reflect on. Um, and so let's continue this dialogue. Let's add some more voices to this. Let's get Dr. Rasfar into this conversation. Dr. Rasfar, your contributions to the field have been numerous. Um, significant and provocative, drawing also on transnational literacy and thinking with your background as a scholar from the East. As one who operates in a large part as an outsider to Caribbean literacies and lives, but also as an outsider to lived American realities, what promise do you believe is instantiated by the Black immigrant literacies framework for connecting all lives? Uh, thank you so much for the question. Uh, I want to uh, first thank uh, Patriana and the panel for inviting me to this very important conversation. Uh, I feel very honored and blessed to have been part of this uh, journey. Uh, and I also want to echo a couple of points that I heard uh, some of my colleagues make, uh, namely uh, Professor Nero and, and Dr. Skerritt. Uh, uh, Dr. Nero, you mentioned something about the uh, interrogating of the colonial logic and, and what I would call the black-white uh, racial logic that sort of uh, we encounter when we're in, in, the, in the United States. And uh, also uh, what Dr. Skerritt mentioned about how finally someone is telling our story. So how, how is this my story? Uh, how, is, how am I coming to this? As someone who is apparently light-skinned, white, uh, I was born in the US. I left the US in 1978. Uh, I emigrated. I was going to go live with my, my family, was going to go back to Iran in 1970 to live forever. Uh, but then within that, within two, three years, there was a revolution and there was war. And so we immigrated back. And that's when I realized I'm an immigrant now. <laughs> and so I, I just brought a couple of, I mean, this is a very complex question, but I, I in 2007, uh, the movie 300, I don't know if you all watched it, let me see if I can show you the screen here. Do you see it? Do you, can you see this? Yes. So if you watch the movie 300, it's basically the battle of, uh, you know, the Greeks against the Persians in this tiny strip of land, the Spartans against the Persians. And the Persians, as you can see, are laid in a pile of dead bodies as these hulking Greek white figures stand triumphant. And you can see uh, the black messenger, the Persian black messenger is kicked into the well on the left-hand corner. And then there's the, uh, there's the fighters who have a mask. They're not seen. And so when I saw this movie in 300, I finally was able to realize that even though on many census, if you're from the Middle East, you, you mark Caucasian white, but you know that socially and politically and in the lived reality of the U.S., you're actually Black. And so in this colonial logic that's binary, you have to pick. And so uh, that explained to me, it made very apparent to me why I was so interested in the debates concerning Black English. 
in the late 90s. I wasn't, I, I, I started to see in that debate myself. But even more so when this debate became about black immigrant literacies, I was even, I was able to find myself a home even more. So I feel very comfortable and at home with the kinds of conversations that are being echoed uh, throughout this book. And more importantly, uh, the practical ways in which uh, we can leverage and elicit these types of literacies in the classroom uh, beyond the static notions of black and white. Uh, and so what this framework is providing and this, the readings in this book is for providing and just this, the scholarship that's, uh, that's, that, this, that this work is built on is allowing us, those who feel that we are being masked in the mainstream and being erased in public spaces uh, to find ourselves and position ourselves and reposition ourselves, I should say, uh, in more dynamic ways and not to accept for ourselves the colonial logic and to see our, and be able to transcend these static uh, boundaries that are imposed upon us and uh, and I find that you know the special issue that we did, as several of you here are authors of, on the algorithm of love, uh, black immigrant literacies, uh, which were narratives rooted in the black literacies, uh, black narrative experience. Uh, we were able to, you know, really make explicit and bring to people's consciousness sort of how we can actually study empirically this process of you know, displaying empathy in the classroom, but more importantly, displaying and practicing linguistic solidarity. And uh, I, I can't think of a better quote uh, than, you know, around the same time that I immigrated, emigrated with an E, uh, James Baldwin wrote a, wrote a paper, an essay, which was asking this fundamental question that I, in the late 90s, became very interested in. Uh, if Black English isn't a language, then tell me what it is. And this line from that essay has always stirred me. And, you know, that, that the Black language and basically the Black immigrant literacies experience. And, and, and as I said, anyone who identifies as part of the global South or the oppressed or anything knows that to use a language other than English or to embrace one's culture and to embrace the other and to sort of become part of this broader black uh, movement community is an alchemy that trans that takes that transforms ancient elements into a new language. And so that's what we're doing today. That's what we're doing with this book, uh, that this language that we're creating is 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 really the the essence and the ethos of of the black immigrant experience. And uh, and I love this idea of this being an alchemical kind of process. Uh, I feel like it's very precise, very exact, and it's brought to our consciousness. And I just wanted to sort of end with uh, highlighting uh, some very power, which I believe is the heart of this book, which is the three M's. Uh, on page 82, and that is that there's this meta-linguistic, meta-racial, and meta-cultural process uh, that teachers are being uh, socialized to, and they're, they're trying to bring to their classrooms. And if we look deeper into, we're going to do a little alchemy right now. Uh, if we take these three ideas and look at the word meta, it, it's, it's actually a Sanskrit word. It comes from the East, since that's how I'm being positioned but it's actually being brought back to the West and being sent back out to the East. And this meta-linguistic, meta-racial, meta-cognitive uh, um, type of process, which is undoing this colonial logic, is born out of a place of benevolence, loving kindness, friendliness, am amity, goodwill, and active interest in others. And I feel like this book is giving us a, a methodology, a practical methodology to do this, to make it happen. So it doesn't just stay in the skies. Uh, and, I, and I'm truly appreciative of this. And I feel like this is a, you know, a very important moment uh, of, of bringing these ideas to life and, and helping us as scholars embrace them in our 
research and in our practice. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. You know, I really hope those of you who are attending are going to share this experience with others and remind them to buy this book and remind them of the, you know, the sage comments and, you know, that you've heard today from all these presenters. So not to leave anyone out, I have one more question for the panelists. However, I'm also monitoring the time and I wanna make sure that we have time to add a couple of questions at least from the audience. So this question goes out to Dr. Watson. Dr. Watson, I know you can do this. You know, um, I've heard you uh, talk before. If you can keep it succinct for us, um, two, three minutes, that would be lovely. Um, but I want to ask you, you are the lead editor of a forthcoming book <laughs> published this spring with Dr. Michelle Knight Manuel and Dr. Smith titled Educating African Immigrant Youth, Schooling and Civic Engagement in K-12 Schools, a book that in many ways broadens the conversation articulated in Black immigrant literacies by focusing largely on the ways in which African immigrants bring ways of knowing and being to literacy practices that are often overlooked. How does the framework for educating African immigrant youth that you present in your new book reinforce the need for um, connecting to Caribbean um, um, American and, I'm sorry, I lost my question. Um, and remove the need for connecting Caribbean, American, and African imager, imi, imageries, sorry, image, imageries across the broader diaspora. Sorry about that, I'm getting tongue tied. Yeah, it's, it's all good. Thank you so much. Uh, so I had the opportunity and honor to work with, the honor to work with Dr. Um, Smith and Michelle Knight Manuel and uh, chapter authors who include black African scholars, early career senior scholars from a range of institutions in the U.S. and Canada. And so I just wanted to uh, note, you know, we conceptualize in this book the framework for educating African immigrant youth comprising these four approaches. Um, and, you know, um, emboldening tellings of diaspora narratives, countering and representing deficit narratives and humanizing the internet, um, the immigrant, the black immigrant body, navigating past, presence, and futures of literacy, language, teaching, and learning, envisioning and enacting social civic literacies and learning to extend complex identities and affirming and extending cultural heritage and embodied knowledges, languages, and practices. And what I wanted to share um, briefly, and I'll, I'll try to be briefly here, is um, thinking about the approaches and thinking about um, so much learning with um, um, Dr. Smith and the framework for Black immigrant literacies and thinking about recentering perspectives and possibilities of the vibrant schooling and civic lives of Black African youth. Um, and we closed the book on this notion of speculative seeing, telling, affirming, building with uh, lived past, present, and future possibilities. So thinking of this um, really important question in terms of um, um, connecting Caribbean, American, and African imaginaries across the broader diaspora, um, we, when we point to this notion of speculative seeing, we reference this unpublished story right here that you see. Uh, it's called The Princess Steel. It was authored by Du Bois. It's a short story from 1908 to 1910, found in his collections in 2015. And it features the, char the, the, the character of a Black sociologist who invents the megascope. It's this viewfinder shaped to resemble this shining trumpet affixed with head and ear and eye and hand pieces through which a viewer glimpses space and time. And the protagonist peering through the megascope views an African princess, hair made of steel, who has been kidnapped and separated from her mother, this metaphor of colonization and exploitation of Africa. And the uh, authors who found this work talk about Du Bois genre work as doing more than challenging stereotypes, but revealing racial art types propping up the genre. And, you know, we reference then, um, this work, such as authors, uh, I'm sorry, artists like Asiko, the Nigerian photographer living and working in London, their Instagram posts who shares uh, these remakings and rethinkings of um, Black um, youth uh, dressed as the main characters from Black Panther. So I'm, so what I'm talking to and thinking with is um, Dr. Smith's um, 
you know, um, you know, stunning and thoughtful notion of authentic narratives. The Monday after the artist posts this on Instagram, um, we see the unveiling of um, U.S. President Barack Obama, son of a Kenyan immigrant, this painting by Kehinde Wiley, whose father is Nigerian. And Kehinde Wiley in his work is a Yale-trained uh, painter, but he takes these depictions of African-Americans and African youth in this sort of style of the, you know, quote, old masters, and he remakes them and reimagines them. Right, so these uh, replaces these European aristocrats uh, with contemporary black subjects, drawing attention. This is from promotional materials uh, of his exhibit to the absence of African Americans from historical and cultural narratives. This notion of speculative seeing, right? Wiley paints Obama here um, in uh, the foliage of his uh, of uh, symbolizing Hawaii, his birth state, the official sh city of Chicago flower. We see there African blue lilies. Um, Obama says, when I always, uh, what I was always struck by whenever I saw Kehinde Wiley's portraits was the degree to which they challenged our conventional views of power, wealth, privilege, the extraordinary care and precision and vision and recognizing the beauty and grace and the dignity of people and putting them on the grand stage. So I'm prompted just to think with and build with and just excited for um, uh, Dr. Smith, the um, these notions of imaginaries uh, that you share with us in these authentic narratives, and um, you know, thinking with um, just closing briefly, you know, um, uh, I was you, I was prompted to 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 have us think with this notion of um, authentic nat extending at what does it mean to ex to think with authentic narratives as methodology, as practice, right, as our everyday ongoing work. So this is really a call to action, right? To deeply rethink, right? Um, you know, and 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 sort of you know recenter um, this notion of building with this notion of work as possibilities toward with and ongoing. So I'll pause there, but thank you so much for your work, Patrianne. Thank you so much, Dr. Watson. Uh, we're going to move immediately to our questions from the audience. The panelist has have been nothing less than outstanding. Thank you so much, panelists. Uh, we have today, uh, Dr. Smith, a group of Rutgers Newark uh, immigrant pre-service teachers attending the webinar today. And their professor is, is asking, um, what are some of, something you can say, uh, some of the things you might uh, say to them to encourage them to embrace their own literacies and the literacies of their future students? Well, first of all, thank you so much, Dr. McMillan, for asking, but also to the uh, pre-service teachers who are here with us. This is absolutely amazing. We're so happy that you're here. And, uh, you know, my first thought, I guess, would go back to the three M's that Dr. Rasper so graciously mentioned from my book. And the three M's having to do with metalinguistic, metacultural, and metaracial understandings. In the book, I show how teachers can help students affirm uh, their the assets that they actually do, do have. But I know that teachers cannot do that if they themselves have not engaged or have not been able to identify their own metalinguistic, metacultural, and metaracial sorts of understandings that they bring to the table. So a lot of this starts with how do pre-service teachers, right, get to the place where they can see through metalinguistic, through metacultural, and through metaracial understandings, the assets that they each bring, that you each bring to the table. Whether you are racialized as Black, racialized as white, racialized as any other group in the United States with a Black-white binary sort of colonial logic uh, operating, what are these understandings that you bring and how do they position you? And then how do you help students through the three M's to identify the ways in which their assets are powerful, are capable of enabling them to demonstrate their capacity for living full and literate lives? I think that is one of the places that I would start. And then the second place that I would probably extend this to 
is uh, looking at, for instance, in the Black Immigrant Literacies Framework, I talk about the global local connection and how we are all connected, whether we are Black in America or Black in the Caribbean, Black in Africa, we are all connected. Whether we are racialized as white in the US or in other spaces, we are connected to each other. How does the colonial logic operate across spaces and how do teachers come to understand that? So how do you come to understand that? What does that actually mean when you understand how it operates perhaps in the Caribbean versus in the United States? What does it mean to locate that understanding in, a, in an orientation that helps you see your literacies in a way that uh, that matter regardless of where you are? And then how do you translate that into practice for children in the classroom on a Monday morning? So I think it really has to do with moving from affirming the self, the self through the three M's first, and then being able to provide students, K-12 students in the classroom with capacities to do that as well, and uh, being intentional about that. There are lots of other mechanisms that I offer in the book, but I think that this is one of uh, the pieces that I, I believe will be very tangible, very concrete, and hopefully easy to remember. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith. You are on fire. This is an awesome book. We remind you to please go and on the website for Teachers College Press and purchase the book. You can get it on Amazon. You can also get it in bookstores worldwide. Uh, Yuri and I are so happy to be the moderators this evening, and we know we're running out of time. We wanted the panelists to be able to say something else, but if you guys will just give a wave, we're going to turn it back over to Dr. Smith to close it out. Thank you so much, all of you, for being here. So thank you again, everyone. We know that there have been lots of questions in the chat, and we are happy to answer these questions and to forward our responses to you. And so we we thank you for just being here and our wonderful panelists and our moderator, Teachers College Press, for sponsoring this amazing session this evening. We never have enough time to have these conversations, but what we are sure about is that there will be other opportunities to engage again, and we hope you can join us then. Get the book, Black Immigrant Literacies, and please do share it with your colleagues and friends. Thanks, everyone, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you all. Thank you. Great panel. Nice to meet everyone. <laughs>